Good evening, those of you joining us in the UK, and good afternoon to those joining us in the US. Um, welcome to all of you uh, for our second talk in our series of spring artist talks. I'm delighted that so many people have um, booked onto this talk to hear uh, Deborah Coombe speak about her work. Please do let us know in the chat uh, where you're joining from this evening um, or this afternoon. Am I there? Oh, hello everyone. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello Deborah, and thank you so much um, for joining us. I know that you are currently in Vermont and there is a lot of snow. Indeed. So let me um, formally introduce you now and um, thank you everybody who's told you us where you're joining us from. I know we've got people from the UK, from the US, from New Zealand, um, so it's a real international audience today and I'm not surprised because our speaker um, is someone who I've wanted to hear from for a long time, Deborah Coops. Um, born in the UK but joining us from Vermont where she has lived now for a, a few decades. Um, Deborah Coombs is an artist and geometer. She studied in the UK um, at Edinburgh College of Art and Swansea College before going on to do an MA in ceramics and glass at the Royal College of Art in London, graduating in 1985. She emigrated to America about 10 years later in 1996, while she was creating 20 stained glass windows for St. Mary's Cathedral in Portland, Oregon. The whole nave is filled with um, Deborah's windows. That's over a thousand square feet of hand painted glass. And I have to say, few glass artists get to um, have such a commission in their lifetime. So I'm sure we will hear a bit about that this evening. Deborah has always believed in the open sharing of information and um, craft skills. And in 2005, she developed an open glass painting mixture that's now used, used by artists worldwide. So these new techniques, which were innovative developments, allow glass paint to be moved around extensively while it's still wet. Um, and and this, these methods were approved by education authorities in New York for use with young children in 2007. So they've had widespread influence, not just amongst stained glass artists. Light has always been foundational to Deborah's work in stained glass. And in 2013, she began exploring mathematical projection as an additional way to investigate this phenomena. And I think this is what makes Deborah's work and career completely unique, because today she uses art, design, craftsmanship to explore geometry and the nature of space. She also published her first peer-reviewed academic paper on her research in mathematical geometry in the Proceeding of the Bridges Conference in Helsinki in 2021. So we're in for a treat uh, this evening or this afternoon. And um, Deborah, I will hand over to you now and come back for questions at the end. Thank you. So, whoa. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, this, mm, let me see, how do I get back to my PowerPoint so I can make it click ahead? Hmm. I need Emily's help. Nothing's happening. There should be an arrow at the bottom there that you can click, I think. I'm not, I'm just seeing the, I'm just bottom, seeing your. Bottom your, left of your screen, Deborah, I think. Ah, oh, let's try this. That's the one. Oh, there we go. Okay, I've got it. Thank you. Okay, this is what my house looked like this morning. Just so you know. And on the left, that building is my studio and that's the front door. And this is my remarkable husband, friend, partner of like 40, how many years? 44 years, trying to get me my car out so that I can come and speak to you. So um, yeah, basically we had three feet of snow, um, 52 hours without electricity, it's just come back on. That means no refrigeration, no flushing toilets, no water, no Wi-Fi. You cannot download things from the, from the cloud. Um, oh my gosh, uh, we have a, a well and a septic system. Um, 
and you know, I had to come into town. I had to like go find someone who, who has a Wi-Fi. So Richard, God bless him, you know, through thick and thin, sickness and in health, right? He's always been there for me. This is just, I have to brag about my paper. You cannot imagine that it is the single most extraordinary thing I've ever done as an artist is write an ac academic paper. You know, I'm really, really proud of myself. And I, I want to tell you that whenever I am struggling with anything, no matter what it is, how great or how small, um, if I'm sick, you know, and I think I'll never recover, I can be lying there and saying to myself, Deb, you wrote an academic paper for Christ's sake, you can get through this, you know? So the, the effort that it took to be here today was kind of nuts, but it was also fun and somewhat crazy. Literally swimming through the snow yesterday to get to my neighbor's house because I'd left my snowshoes in the car so that I could do a tech prep um, meeting with, with Jasmine. So, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so pleased that everyone else is here. And now I want to talk to you a little bit more about why I do what I do. So I have to be serious, I have to get serious with you for a minute, okay? Driving in this morning, it's only a 15 minute drive between my home and the nearest city, which is North Adams, Massachusetts. Um, the snow that we have is unusually wet and there's something going on. It's a very heavy snowfall for so late in the spring. And if you look at those trees on the left, these are really bowed down under the weight. There were so many fallen branches. Um, and friends of mine who live in Buffalo, New York, have had two intense seven feet of snow coming down this one winter. And generally speaking, that happens once every 10 years. So people say that climate change is not real, but it is. I want you to know that. And I oh, ask myself, what am I supposed to do about that? Does anybody else ever ask this? Like one small person, I'm five foot one, those snow drifts are bigger than me. What are we supposed to do in, as individuals about the state of the world and the state of our society, the state of our culture? And um, I tell you, I figure it out. I, I know what I need to do. I need to do two things. I need to be true to myself and further my own work to fulfill whatever my purpose is. Um, and I need to participate in the next generation in, in raising the next generation of people who will inherit this planet um the environmental damage that we're causing is is dreadful and when yes i've watched through i've watched uh, we've lived through hurricanes in vermont and now we're living through these storms and i just want to know when will we wake up as humans so my wonderful neighbors near where i live uh, on rue madeline I've sat down at their dinner table just bleating and saying, what am I supposed to do? What can one person do? And this is it. We have to step up to the plates and be an example to younger generations and guide and lead, even when we don't feel fit to do it. Because we've either, because we've participated in the mess that's in the planet, on the planet, or because, you know, I don't think I'm grown up enough to be an elder, but you kind of have to be. And this doesn't matter whether we're talking about stained glass or we're talking about other things in the world. So my good friend, uh, Amy Gilberg, who lives nearby, pointed out to me just a, a few months ago that we have, in order to be integrated with the planet, we need to be integrated within ourselves. OK, and I... We, we, the way I see my body now is that you have a body, you have an intellect and you have an emotional body and to fully function as humans, we need all those things to be synchronized. And we can do that, I can do that, or I have done that through making art and through geometry. So when it became clear to me that I wasn't my intellect, so I just own an intellect, like I'm not my body, I just sort of own a body, um, I then realized that how I, how I manage those two things together, my mind and my body, and how my emotional body does or doesn't cramp that, how I can allow myself to be fully whole, it's almost like my life's work, trying to figure that stuff out. And it's through my work and my family 
that I've actually been able to figure that out. So I'm not kidding when I talk about, you know, Richard being, my husband Richard being so precious to me and my children being so precious to me. I, I asked myself this question, like, who are we when we're children? And how do we grow up to be who we are? Like, what's going on? So in this series of windows, this is a small series of panels that I made for exhibition. The, um, this is pure art. It's not commission. It's just stained glass made for the sake of making stained glass. And um, I basically uh, was invited to exhibit. I've never felt very confident about my right to hold that title of artist. So I was invited to exhibit at um, Kids Space, in a, that's a gallery for children in the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. And um, between 2007 and about to 2013, I made more than a dozen stained glass panels. And I didn't have a theme. I just went into the studio and started making things. And I realized that all these windows had like a, a little boy in them or a man. Um, and some of them, oh, I was looking for one with my dad in it. So often my dad is in these windows and he's sleeping. <laughs> um, so in this series, I'm looking at men and realizing that there's hidden behind or inside of every man is a little boy and that we still contain the kind of germ of our childhood, all of us, as we grow up. And I'm so curious about why some of us flourish and sometimes some of us don't and and how that all unfolds so in my family I'm one of five children we were this is my brother my youngest brother James uh, and this is a, this is an image of somebody this is nobody in particular but that's definitely my brother James and he's wearing his middle school uniform in that picture um, I'm, the, I'm the middle child of five, um, three brothers and two sisters. And, and, well, the boys have all gone on and done different things in their lives. My sister and I both had a lot of um, mental health problems and we struggled a lot. And I guess I, I, I wonder how I got how I got to be who I am from the little girl that I was, you know, who was I when I was a little girl? I was basically afraid of everything. I was afraid of the dark and spiders and slugs and gooey things. I was even afraid of the laundry basket halfway up the stairs because it smelled funny. And um, wow, I was profoundly lonely in the midst of a large family. And um, I had a night, I used to have a nightmare when I was a child that would recur, you know, night after night, where I would see myself as if I was from outer space. And I'd see that I was a little tiny little child alone in the middle of a desert. And I could see from outer space that there was nobody near me for thousands and thousands of miles. And then suddenly it would be like a switch would flick and I'd suddenly see myself as if I was in the middle of a crowd. It was the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, which, by the way, I've never been to, I don't know what it's like, but in my childhood nightmare, I'd be in the middle of this bazaar, bizarre, surrounded by people and I'd still be alone, lonely. And it's profound and terrible sort of feeling. Um, so I now know that this is called, <laughs> mental health workers have a name for that, it's called dissociation. Um, to a great extent, I uh, just dealt with it and coped with it the best way I could. Um, I could draw when I was a child, kind of a miracle. Oh, my arrows have gone away. My arrows have gone away. My arrows have disappeared. Oops, I need help, Emily. They'll either be in the bottom left-hand corner or if you've got a keyboard with back and forth arrows, um, you'll okay, be able to easy. cycle through. Yeah, let's do that. They've disappeared. Thank you, Emily. So... Thank you, Desmond. So, yeah, so, so there you go. This is, this is my, my question, like, who are we? How do we grow into who we are? And how does your, how does your childhood unfold into you becoming who you are um, as an adult? So, um, I've got to say, drawing 
and geometry, these were like my saving graces, you know, I could draw when I was little. And uh, that was handy. I made a lot of self portraits, which weren't very cheerful. This is the series that um, the work that's at Ely comes from. I'm gonna go back because I'm moving too fast. You ready? So this, this is a, a photograph of me when I was a student at Swansea College of Art, right there at the bench. And collaged in on the left, this is a photograph of me when we emigrated. So there's a bit of time that passed there. Um, we emigrated in 1996 to the United States uh, because I had this big commission in, in Oregon that Jasmine mentioned. And I got that big commission because of this one cover of this stained glass quarterly magazine that the people on the committee saw and thought would be interesting. Or they thought I might be an interesting artist. Um, down here on the bottom right, this is a piece that's in the permanent collection of the Stained Glass Museum. So let me see if I can. Okay, so here's some of those early drawings. And here's some of those drawings made into stained glass. So I thought the world was hostile at the time, and it kind of was. I have to tell you, I submitted one of these small panels to the Crafts Council, and I got a review back, uh, typed up and sent in the mail that said that my glass painting was unnecessarily crude in the example that I provided. That didn't help much. Um, I'm glad that the piece that you have in the museum, uh, Jasmine, is an angry one and not a kind of depressed looking one of my self portraits, because some of them just look miserable and some of them look angry. So. I also worked with collage, seeing this one on the right here. Um, I, that's what I felt like, uh, that I was carrying the world and trying to birth myself, you know, trying to become who I was, but with so many burdens and so many um, mental health struggles and so many issues with life that it was difficult for me. So glass, stained glass, making things, was really my way to sanity, I would say. That piece on the left is the one that's in the Museum at Ely. It's called Mask. The one on the right is part of the same series of windows. It was called, the series was called uh, One Woman's Narrative. One Woman's Narrative. And it was the first ever series of artwork that I made. The Men Folk that I showed you before is a later series. So here's another really early piece. Um, it's lovely to include this um, because this one was also exhibited at Ely and my husband Richard remembers working with Susan Matthews at the time um, and hauling it up on some kind of winch from the floor of the cathedral up to the Triforium where the museum is. This piece is about two meters high um, and thanks to my brother James and his wife Zeta, it's installed in a house in Reading. And unfortunately, when the house is sold, the window will be sold because it's fixed in there now. But it's lovely that it's been preserved. It's a bit of a problem when we make huge pieces of art and they have no home. But that's sometimes the way it is, you know. Let me draw your attention to how much I loved pattern and geometry early on. And also how interested I was in different um, types of glass. Those round lenses that you see on the right are opalescent, which means that they hold the light longer. So at nighttime, when that whole piece goes black, you'll still see those opalescent pieces shining. I never use opalescent in a random way. I use it to express the Holy Spirit or something a bit like the way the Aztecs would use gold because it doesn't tarnish, you know, opalescent is very special material. And I come from the European tradition where we use mostly transparent glass. So look also at the lead lines and you'll see that I decided early on that I did not want my windows to look like 
tiles in the shower with grout between them. I didn't want the lead to be a drawn line in the way that it is often used in German windows. I wanted the lead to become part of the picture so that you're looking at layers of space, layers of, um, so, so you're looking at layers like um, the, the darker area is, is, is distinctly different that dark blue horizontal to the other triangles. So you're looking at objects. There you go. That's what I'm trying to say. You're looking at objects. So, so geometry, right? In those early days, I'm not kidding when I tell you that geometry kind of saved my life because it, it's geometry is a sort of perfection. It's it, if you're obsessed as a perfection, you know, obsessed with perfection, which many people are when they have mental health struggles, right? You want things to be perfect. And of course they can't really be perfect, but with geometry, you can get pretty close to perfect. So th this, the example that I'm showing you is a piece of drawing that I did. This is the most recent commission I did. It's for Helena um, Montana. It's for um, Carroll College, which is a Catholic college. And this is the symbol that I, drew for the Alpha and the Omega. Um, and on the right there, you can see the part of that window on the bench. Uh, so I, when I say, you know, art and geometry were, that, that was like grace that entered my life as a child and it made things work for me. I shall never, ever, ever forget my very, very first day at infant school. So I would have been four years old, almost five. And I was brought down the front of the class to sit next to this little boy called Robert um, and to help him. And what we had to do was put the ruler down and just draw a straight line against a ruler, lots of little children. And little Robert couldn't do it without making a bump in his thumb. And I just was broken hearted watching his big, big tears plop down to the paper because he couldn't draw a line against the ruler. And I could, I could draw straight lines against the ruler and I could draw and it kind of made me feel like I was okay, you know? And, and, it, it, and it wasn't a sense of one-upmanship. You know, I, it, Robert was one of those very poor kids post-war. He didn't have clean clothes and he, was not cared for and my mum did a great job of looking after us even though we were quite we were very poor um it, it, my sense with, with Robert was oh my goodness in the world through the things that I can do I have good hand skills I can draw I can um I can I can create beautiful six petal daisies with a compass that line up precisely and I can help people and so it kind of really, truly, this love of art and drawing and geometry was rooted in me when I was really, really, really young. Geometry is, the, it, it, it's the closest you can get to something being perfect when you make a geometric drawing and it all lines up. It's a thrilling feeling, particularly when the world is terrifying and you're lost <laughs> and everything seems illogical and irrational and kind of frightening. Geometry is a very, very, very comforting place to stay. So I managed to get into art school. It's kind of a miracle. I mean, it really is a miracle. I mean, I went to, um, I, so many, many people helped me along the way when I was t a teenager. I think many people could see me for who I was when I couldn't see myself as anything except broken. And there were people who guided me and supported me. Um, this was when I met my husband, Richard. Um, I spent an exchange year in Portland, Oregon as a teenager and my family in, in, in uh, Oregon supported me. When I came back, I went to art school in Edinburgh and I discovered I had these fantastic cousins in Edinburgh who cared for me, particularly my aunt Winnie and my cousin Sandra. Um, Swansea, look at that little photograph down there. I know that some of you are here <laughs> watching who were at Swansea with me. I mean, wow. <laughs> uh, it was a fantastic place to study stained glass in those days. Absolutely marvelous. Um, second to none, really. And Edinburgh 
so I first went to Edinburgh and I did two years up there. I did my foundation at Edinburgh, which was fantastic. A whole year of drawing, a whole day of drawing every week, a whole day of sculpture every week, a whole day of painting every week. And two days were allocated to like the liberal arts or is that the right word? We, that included graphics, tapestry, jewelry, glass blowing, stained glass, whatever. And then I specialized in stained glass for one year. And then Amber Hiscott, who some of you know, came to speak in Edinburgh and I decided I really wanted to transfer to Swansea, um, which I did. And in those days, remarkably, you did not pay to go to college. If you got in, you've got your O-levels and your A-levels and you've got a place, not only would you get in, but you'd get a grant to study. Yeah, I think about that now and it's just remarkable. We're very, very lucky. And then I had this second extraordinary layer of training, which was just kind of inadvertent, really. I needed a job and I wanted to work in stained glass studios. These are photographs. Well, in the back, you can see a photograph of the Albert Memorial. So that's my class at the Royal College of Art when we graduated. I have a, an MA in ceramics and glass. Um, but the God Island Gibbs was at the time Britain's biggest stained glass studio. I have about 60 employees and they paid my fees to go to the Royal College. So the master's program wasn't covered by any grants. Um, and I worked at Goddard Gibbs on and off for really quite a long time. And I worked on some extraordinary projects. So, so here, I think you can see on the right, that's James Weatherly. And Jimmy Weatherly was the chief glass cutter. I learned a lot from him. And then that's Paul um, Chapman, um, with the bald head and Paul was the cartoonist there. He did all the full-size drawings, learned a huge amount from him as well. Um, and then on the left there, this is just one of many projects. This is the a wedding hall in, um, in um, I forgot, um, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, and I would be given, I, I was a project manager at a really young age, so in my twenties, and I would be given, huge stack of blueprints and a sketch by the artist. This design was by um, Alan Younger and it'd be, expect be expected to manage the team and make the windows. So look at this picture on the bottom right. You can't see it very well, but it's a mosque from the outside. And that mosque is in um, Duran in Saudi Arabia. So here's another picture of that moss. So look at that blue, beautiful blue pattern on the top left. Can you see the human being? There is a man wearing a long white robe and that gives you a scale of this project. So this was 10,000 square feet of work. 10,000 square feet of stained glass, all designed by Alan Younger and made at Goddard and Gibbs Studios. And I was a project manager. I got to literally the stack of blueprints is like this and they're big blueprints in those days. And, and, and lots and lots of scale drawings done by Alan Younger. And my job was to make sure that everything fit properly when they got out there to install it. Um, that it was cut accurately that it got, I mean, I had to make a progress chart to keep track of everything, you know, make sure that everything was made properly and um, that the job got done on time because there were penalty clauses if a job didn't get done on time. So Jasmine mentioned my job in Portland, Oregon, which was the job that we, um, the, the job that we emigrated in the middle of. Oh, I want to say one more thing about Goddard and Gibbs. Excuse me, I want to go back. But we did a huge amount of work on domes. So imagine that picture on the bottom left of the wedding hall in, in Jeddah. That, imagine that pattern wrapped around a fiberglass surface like the underside of a kayak. Uh, we made curved domes at Goddard and Gibbs. Fantastic work. So in this picture of the Aramco Mosque, you can see the curves of the Mirhab. So we were, we were actually working on 3D stained glass windows all those years ago. So when I got to do St. Mary's Cathedral, 
it was still big. I was on my own. I didn't have a studio. I, I worked with Cummings Studios in North Adams, Massachusetts. So I did have a studio, but what I mean, it was nothing like working for Goddard and Gibbs. It was thrilling um, and it was absolutely terrifying, by the way, absolutely terrifying. So <laughs> commissions, <laughs> commissions, um, I hope that there are other people out there like me who get commissions and don't feel fit to do them, but somehow you do them. In this commission, the major part of the commission were these nave windows that had figures in them. Think about my figures. My figures were terrible. Nothing that was suitable for a church at all. Um, and what I was given from the archbishop was a sort of shopping list of saints. There's this person who did that and that person who did that. And, and here they are, just make them into windows. It was up to me to decide how to put them in windows. And all of the saints were American. They came from the North or the South America. So they could be Canadian or they could be from South America or the Americas, the US, what is now the US. Um, and when I looked at the list of saints, I realized early on that this was actually the story of the Christianizing of the American continent. It wasn't just like a few windows, you know, it was very, very thoughtfully chosen saints. So I did things like, I put this Mohawk, the first Native American Catholic mystic, Kateri Tekakwita, I put her like a Madonna in the center of a window surrounded by the two of the Jesuit martyrs. I thought about how the story should be told and I wanted the saints to be like pictures in an exhibition. I wanted them to be like portraits surrounded by the quality, the, 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 the patterns, the plants, the, the sort of all the things that existed in the Americas before the white people came. So see this, this is Junipero Serra. He was difficult to work with because he enslaved the Indians and the native people were trying to prevent him from being canonized at the time I was working on the project. So on the right there, there's one of the California mission churches that I made in stained glass, but coming out the top there, that band is actually um, Zuni pattern. It's from the tribal people. So I took on this massive job that I felt really intensely about, that I felt was very important that it was done well. And I was incompetent as far as I was concerned. I had no idea how to paint appropriate portraits of saints. There's a whole nother story to tell about that, but I want to tell you one thing is that Richard helped me enormously, my husband there. We were living in Cheltenham and, and London at the same time, and he was encouraging me to just gather all the data I could about each saint, like um, as if I was Helen Mirren in Prime Suspect. And he found me all these bits of phone cord that he picked up by the side of the road somewhere. And I just gradually, in the days before the internet, um, oh, with the great help of Sister Jean Bosley from the Catholic Library Association, learned and read every single thing I could about the saints, gathered it all together, and then somehow transformed that into a picture. You know, every single thing that I'm showing you just about, I could talk for an hour on. So I'm going to try and just move on here. Here's the, here's the geometry. How does the geometry connect? It connects absolutely directly into all my work. This is also St. Mary's Cathedral in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so if you look on the right there, you can see a, there is um, an etched glass French embossed screen that I made, designed and had made at Goddard and Gibbs actually, they were not made in America. And if you can see through the screen, you can see those nave windows that we were talking about. The one on the left is a Hawaiian window for Father Damien. The one in the middle that's sort of red is a, a Peruvian pattern and that's for the saints who worked uh, in that part of America. And the one on the right is actually Italian, at Italian, European style. Um, see those blue windows, the one on the bottom right and the top left? Those were the clear story windows in the church and they, what the committee wanted was the seven signs of the sacraments and one symbol for the church. And I was very, very uh, interested in the idea of unity, um, diversity that could be expressed as unity. So that piece of geometry was a piece that I came up with um, 
that contains every single sacrament. So see on the bottom right, you can see that is the font. So that was the sacrament of baptism. You might be able to discern the two rings for matrimony or the three rings for the Trinity. Uh, it's an interesting geometry because it's sevenfold and that represents the seven fathers of the church. Uh, so one thing that was challenging and exciting about this was I had to come up with a new symbol for reconciliation. And reconciliation is what used to be called penance, where you'd be beaten with a, you know, with a, with a, you'd wear a hair shirt and be beaten. And uh, uh, reconciliation is now recognized by the church as being um, a, a conversion of heart. So that's a new symbol. And, I, and this job I finished in 97. I'm hoping now that that symbol has become more in common usage. Um, artists have enormous power and enormous responsibility enormous responsibility. Um, some of you who are tuning in are not stained glass people. So this is my really super fast explanation of how do you make a window? Well, this is a 25 foot window. So if you look at the middle picture, can you see me at the bottom? That was hanging over the balcony at Mass Mocha, the museum in Massachusetts where my family work. Um, on the left is a scale design. So no matter how big the window is or how small, it's really helpful to make a scale design before you make your window. That would be, I would begin with lots of sketches, lots of scribbles and eventually make a scale design. That means it's exactly, for example, one to 12 or one to 10. And then you, the whole thing has to be drawn out full size. So. There, there I am with my 25 foot high drawing in the middle and on the right there's the finished window. How do you get there? How do you get there? <laughs> you do a lot of drawing and my cartoons are really big and untidy. You can see all the blue masking tape on the left, you know, I stick things on and they fall off and I change the scale and move them around and I use whiteout or acrylic or stick pieces of white paper over the bits that are wrong. I'm absolutely indiscriminate about my drawing technique because the cartoon is just a means to an end. It's gonna be a draw, it's, it will turn out to be, it's the window that's the finished piece. It's the window that will last for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, whether you like it or not. That insect picture in the middle there, upper right, that is the Tiffany window that was directly opposite my window. So although I don't paint in a Tiffany style and I don't use opalescence, um, I wanted to, while I was working, I was using the composition of the Tim Tiffany to drive my own composition. I love the way that soldier is just falling out of the, you know, of the picture frame. And that was what you'll see in this window. It's in New York City, it's Marble Collegiate Church. I worked with Rambush Studios. Thank you for this fantastic opportunity that they gave me, I made two windows with them for this church in Manhattan. You can see it, it's there forever. Um, so once you have that full size drawing, you have to cut hundreds and hundreds of pieces of colored glass. Again, those of you who don't make stained glass, I just want you to recognize that you don't paint the color. The color is in the glass. The paint is black and it blocks out the light. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's, it's pretty much that. So here I am at Rambush Studios. And when I work on a commission, even with a big studio, I do all of the design work, all of the drawing, all of the pattern making and the cut lining as we call it. And I select every single piece of glass. Uh, in this instance, this um, uh, assistant who worked for Rambush Studios, she cut all the glass. So I would specify the color and put the pattern on the glass and she would cut it all. And then I, drove everything up to Vermont and painted it all. So here you go. On the left, you see a little piece of cartoon. In the middle, you see what I call the bare naked glass. And then on the right, that's what it looks like when it's painted. Square foot after square foot after square foot. There's a lot of glass. So I wanna show you this again. This is for the benefit of anyone who does not make stained glass windows. Here's a section of cartoon. Here's a piece of tracing paper laid over the top. This is the cut line. 
Okay, cut line shows me exactly where to cut the glass, the shapes of the glass, and it actually shows me where there's sandblasting done. In this particular window, there's color that has to be removed by a mechanical process. So um, the cut lining itself is a creative drawing. You're not just tracing something, it's an art drawing in the same way. It may be a means to an end, but the way you cut line affects the quality of your work. There you go. See the glass? Um, the bit that's got those white squiggly bits on it, that's the white horses of the waves, uh, that, that is glass that has a skin of one color and underneath that it's clear. So that's what we call flashed glass. And that glass has been sandblasted. So you do get two colors on one piece of glass. Mostly you don't. There it is painted. Let me go back. There's the naked glass. There's the painted panel. I teach glass painting. I teach glass painting because it is my responsibility to pass on what I know to future generations. And this mixture that I've developed is great for everybody. There's nobody who cannot paint glass. I've had glass blowers and I've had tattoo artists and I've had mosaicists and all kinds of people come to study glass painting with me. This was painted by um, a seven-year-old and it's just adorable. And look at the way she's handling um, the opacity and the transparency. This is one thing I teach when in, in design workshops basically is, how to manipulate opacity and transparency. Like, why don't you just paint on paper? You could, but you don't get the light. You don't get the light and the sparkle and the movement and you don't get the opalescence. So paint is used to manipulate transparency. Here's another piece painted by a child. This was actually part of the, um, my, when I did my menfolk series that was exhibited at Mass Mocha, um, the, uh, we had to do a, a project in the school and this was that project that I did I made a big window with some kids every single child uh, in the school painted a little piece of glass and oh this is I will teach basically until the good lord tells me that I'm finished with teaching I mean I do think it's my responsibility but I do not teach conservation or restoration painting at all I teach painting for artists so in this, I may give a student a razor blade to paint with. I'm very likely to take all of their brushes away um, <laughs> because I want everybody's teaching, everybody's glass painting to be unique. It's not my goal to teach people to um, paint like me, not at all. Oh, this will show so you what the paint's like. An idea of how you might want to do this. A sweet glass box. And I know the camera can't see this. Hands, because I'm not hands. But you never use it. Oh, that's, I was, see, I'd forgotten in that short period of time. So that little fingernail sprinkle kind of looks like it, it's sort of um, like binding twine. Mm -hmm. Love the way it's just pigment. But how it's going to change as I get this paint. So what was the next one I was going to do before I did the glass? Let's think about those simple. Let's see if this works. This is an experiment, right? Somebody just went outside and did something. Let's just put that in. And what the show is. So I need to have to this. Oh, wow. So, so I went in. So in order to. How about if that we um, clear the area that we want to really clear out? Why not work
Well, this is the first thing about the way this is ships up. So this, I tell you, to work on this kind of printmaking, you're going to want to get the consistency of the paint correct. Well, it's, going to, it's going to correct, but it's going to give you a different effect. So if you try that, so if you try that with wetter paint, it's going to be slightly different. Okay, enough. What am I doing now? I want to tell you what I'm doing now. I love working on collaborations with other artists. I've discovered it's a marvelous antidote to loneliness. <laughs> My life is nothing like it was when I was a little girl. It's joyful now and full of remarkable things. This is a space satellite, and this is the window that I made for the space satellite. I think all I can tell you about this is I'd love to give you my hour long presentation about this project. It's called All Utopias Fell. It is the project of this artist, Michael Oatman. He's a fantastic artist who does installations and collage the old fashioned way, analog as they call it, uh, with, a, with a little scalpel. And below on the left is his first design for the airship, the space satellite. And I didn't mean to offend him. We're very good friends now. But I looked at it and I said, well, it's all right, Michael, but it's not as exciting as your big collage is. Um, and he went away for a whole year and he came back with this new design. And I'm not, can you see how indignant I look in that photograph on the top left? I mean, the, Denise Marconish, the curator, does a brilliant interpretation of me looking at, peeling the paperback and looking at this design and going, oh, 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 I had no idea how to make that. Here's the design. I spent months pondering over it. I was actually working on something else at the time. Uh, and then I slowly began to figure out how it could be made into a window. And I did. And the painting was so fun. And there's the window. Every single thing in that window is meaningful the whole thing is only two feet by four feet it was a thrilling fun thing to work on unfortunately i've almost talked for my hour so i can't really spend much time talking about it all utopias fell by michael oatman that's the design just to remind you So the other thing I'm doing today is the maths and the geometry. We were just speaking about that. So this is another little panel from the Men Folk series. And, you know, even when they're men in my paintings, they're kind of me often in different ways. And this little boy, he's me. He's got a little cheeky embryo on his hat, like as if he could become something one day. I don't know why he's masked. I made this window long, long before COVID. Um, you can see my printmaking techniques actually on the handkerchief, can't you, on his mask um, and the eagle. So he's listening. Look at his eyes. He's listening. He's listening. It's kind of what I do. I listen, ponder, spend a lot of time thinking about things wondering what's out there, wondering what it's all about. How did I grow up to be who I am? This is the very, very last window in my Men Folk series. And that fellow on the top left is Sir Roger Penrose. And he is the British mathematician who discovered this pattern back in 1978 when I was at the Royal College of Art. And um, I was obsessed with this pattern then, all those years ago. And I just put it to one side for a few decades, three, four decades, and then began working on it again more recently. So see that fellow down the bottom on the, on the right there? He's a student. And you know, he's just a sort of generic student. So really, he's me. He's thinking. His eyes are in that same position. He's pondering and he's wondering. And see those little red squares above his head? That's Superman. And I don't know whether the Superman that is Sir Roger Penrose, who invented the math, is like 
coming down to the student or whether the student's kind of leaping up to meet him. But um, I knew that I'd finished my menfolk series with this panel. It was my last panel. And then I started doing more and more and more tiling. So anybody seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind where um, the actor goes off and he makes models of um, Devil's Tower out of mashed potato and people are painting it and things like that. I am completely absorbed with this one pattern. I'll make it in any material that I can make it in. I'm learning about this one pattern and this one geometry. It's very, very, uh, it's, it's basically non-Euclidean geometry. So when you look at it, you think it repeats, but it doesn't repeat. So um, this piece on the right is called a mirrored quasi-crystal. So I've made this, in different patterns and different materials. Um, it, how do I say it? Okay, it's a mathematically precise sculpture and it shows like a shadow of a specific slice of five dimensional geometry. So five dimensions, yeah. When you're an artist, you just think to yourself, well, that's ridiculous. What does that even mean? Well, in mathematics, five dimensions is not complicated. Uh, a dimension just means, um, another variable that can be measured in two directions, right? So in maths, it makes sense, but I wanted to see what it actually would look like. So if, because you can't draw something that's five-dimensional, the best you can do is draw the shadow of it projected down. So anyone who's familiar with the allegory of Plato's cage, think about how those prisoners who were looking at the back wall of the cave, they thought they were looking at real things, but they were just looking at shadows. So. I've been looking at two and three dimensional shadows of a five dimensional grip of, of cubes. It just sounds nuts. So I'm just gonna leave it there with you, but I'm very serious about it. So this structure very closely relates to the structure of quasi crystals and quasi crystals are a type of matter that exists in the universe where the if the molecules are all running around like crazy, it's called an amorphous solid. And if the molecules are neatly structured like a honeycomb, that it is a crystal. A quasi-crystal has, it's clearly a crystal, you can see, but it doesn't conform to Euclid's traditional laws of geometry. So there's something mysterious about it that's still to be discovered. And that's what's exciting to me is working on trying to figure that out. Um, so this quasi-crystals as materials are not formed naturally on the planet. They're formed in outer space as meteorites and we make them in laboratories. And I've been working and connecting with a team at Brown University who build quasi-crystals in the lab and learning a lot about them. So in the lab, uh, we make quasi-crystals for a, a wide array of purposes. Like for example, um, non-stick frying pans have a quasi-crystalline surface. Uh, um, photovoltaics use quasi-crystalline structures. Um, uh, we can harden steel for use in military purposes. Uh, we can also, I find this one just fascinating, we, we not me, in science, quasi-crystalline structures are being investigated for their potential as cloaking devices. That means as invisibility shields because of the peculiar way that they reflect light. So in this sculpture on the right, which I made with a load of students from Williams College and with my dear, dear friend and mathematical instructor, Dwayne Bailey, who's a computer scientist and worked on many of these projects with me, um, I, this one I call cloaking device. What I wanted to do was find out how, if you build a quasi-crystal at macro scale, as opposed to at nano scale, can we see these effects of light bouncing around? And this sculpture is really remarkable because if you light it with a single light source, it will cast five like super highways of light across the ceiling as if somehow you can see this five dimensional form this five-dimensional imaginary thing. You can somehow see it uh, in the sculpture. It's mysterious. Uh, it's also very straightforward math. It's very straightforward to a mathematician. It's just not to me. So I want to see it. I don't just want to be told about it theoretically. So, so for me, I'm a visual person. And I, the, 
there are lots of different ways of knowing about things in the world. And math provides one way of knowing, making things with your hands and building things, like building stained glass, like painting. It gives you a brilliant way to interact with the world and a beautiful way to learn things. So I, this is where I am actually using all of my lifelong skills in art and design to do explore physics and geometry and make a contribution. I'm making a small contribution to science, kind of thrilling. I think I have one more to show you and that's it. There is a, there is a, oh, it didn't work, did it? Mm. What can you see? Do the slide show button, Deborah, again, and we'll see if it, it opens up. Uh, can you share? Go to the present view. Mm, okay. At the bottom. I don't see, oh, it's because it's covered over by the, uh, I got it. Go down there and now see if it'll work. Yeah, you, you should, you've got the play bar there. Yeah, I've got two things covering over me. Here we go. This is, thank you. This is three sculptures photographed, rotating, made in collaboration with Duane Bailey, who designed. hear me but I'll just tell you in, in this sculpture that we're looking at now all of those 
Dark colored tiles can be predicted to infinity. None of the light tiles can be predicted. It's like, a, it's like in quantum mechanics, where you begin looking, affects the, the pattern for an unknowable period of time it will change the pattern. Thank you, Deborah. I think that was your last slide. Just check I'm not jumping in too soon. Not, not at all. Um, we've had lots of people um, just exclaiming how brilliant this talk has been, and I'll make sure all those comments get to you. Um, thank you so much for a real illuminating presentation. And we've been up into space. We've talked about climate change. We've, we've blown our mind in three, five dimensions and also been in churches thinking about the kind of catalogue of saints out there and, and how best to um, explore them. So we've really been uh, all sorts of places this evening and um, really, really stimulating talk. So thank you. Um, I will invite um, people on the call to put their questions into the Q&A uh, for Deborah now. And I will kick off with one while you're thinking. Um, and one I think that other people will have wanted to ask as well, which is, can you please tell us a bit more about the space satellite? Is this actually, <laughs> did this actually go into space? <laughs> so I, I got to tell you, my husband, Richard, so we came to North Adams, Massachusetts, because that's where the um, studio was, that I won the commission for the cathedral in Portland, Oregon with. It's kind of nuts. We were living in London, East End. Richard and I had bought a house and we had two young children and a German shepherd dog. And I won this job in, in Oregon at the same time as he won a job in Cheltenham. He took a new, he was, took a teaching job in Cheltenham. So we um, emigrated and um, <laughs> the reason we stayed in this area is because there was a new, a new contemporary art museum being built, right? And it was in embryonic form and they needed smart, capable people. And the guy who was the director at the time, he snaffled Richard up. I just remember having a, a, a brief coffee appointment with him. And somebody thought I should meet him and I met him. And he said, well, what does your husband do then? I said, well, he's a bronze caster. He's a very capable sculptor. I mean, if you want that pepper pot, like 40 feet high on the top of that building, kind of stuff Richard does. And he was like, tick, 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 tick. Hmm, I'll have those criddles if it kills me. So he just basically kind of snaffled Richard up. So that's why we live where we live. So this art museum is 13 acres of contemporary art in, um, in old mill buildings. And one of the projects that Richard did during his many years as the director of installation and art fabrication at the museum, that's the job he had when we finally got green cards and he got a title, that was his job. When he had that job within, I mean, it can't have been more than seven years in, Michael Oatman came to the museum and the curators invited him. And he said, I just want to imagine, I want to imagine that somebody um, um, was lived in, worked at these mill buildings when they were an electronics factory and stole all the components to build a space satellite. So he, the artist Michael Oatman imagined that that could have been built by someone who could have worked in those factories. So that lovely picture of it flying is my photoshoppery skills. <laughs> All of the rest of the creative work there is Michael Oatman's, I just made the window for Michael. So no, sadly it didn't fly, it didn't. 
Um, and it would have been a miracle if the satellite had landed right there at Mass Mocha. You can still see it today. It's there. You can come to Massachusetts and you can see the window and the space satellite. It's again, it's called All Utopias Fell. Michael's a very, very serious artist and his work is well worth looking, looking into and looking up. Really? Are you disappointed it didn't fly? No, I'm not disappointed. I still think it's the, the only stained glass in the space shuttle I know and that's good enough for me. <laughs> um, Deborah, I just wonder if you want to stop sharing your screen because the last slide is, is black, so it's, it'll appear on people's screen sure. and we'll continue to take um, questions. And um, Barry has helpfully uh, put a link to the All Utopias Fell artwork in the chat if anyone wants to oh. look that up. Okay, um, we'll continue to to take some questions. We'll we'll do. I think we'll do glass and then mathematics if that's okay, because um, then it keeps keeps those things. I mean, then they're not at all separate in your work. Um, but but I, I wanted to to say to those of us in the UK as well. It was really nice to hear about Goddard and Gibbs in in that heyday. Um, they really were the last kind of bastion for for big big British stained glass studios and really interesting to hear of your time there it's really important part of our stained glass history uh, in, in quite recent years but that hasn't yet been documented or recorded so thank you for for sharing your your time there um, Michelle wants to know what kind of glass you use and this is connected to the kind of decline of the glass industry in the in the UK anyway uh, because we have you know lost Hartley Wood um, studios and English antique glass also now closed so there was no active uh, mouth blown coloured glass makers in the UK. Uh, so what in your opinion is the best glass? And I know yeah. that would be different for different artists. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, hello. Michelle worked with me at Goddard and Gibbs on those upside down kayak bottoms where we actually made domes, right? So um, I really fell in love with the glass that we used there. And I've only, in my own work, I just use Lambert's. And the, the, the two exceptions are, and this comes from John Lawson, who was the designer at Goddard and Gibbs, he would use certain spectrum glasses. So the spectrum water glasses are trans, translucent and sparkly, and also the GNA or the, the drawn sheet, what we call semi-antique, right? So my work is still always transparent. I'm controlling opacity with paint, but I don't use opalescence unless it's like special stuff. Like I say, I use the opalescent as if I was making an image of God in gold and I was an Aztec. I use it because it's really special. The way it holds light, completely different to the way a transparent window works. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got a couple of questions on the, the, the maths. Um, Duggan asks, what was your experience working with mathematicians on Quasi crystals, sorry, quasi crystals and Penrose tilings. You might have to explain what Penrose tilings are. Yeah, the, the very last menfolk piece that I showed you had a blue background with these little diamonds, and the diamonds, the diamond pattern was discovered in 1978, and has since been discovered. So what happened? The diamond pattern was discovered, and then subsequently, somebody looking down an electron microscope said, "Oh my gosh, I can see fivefold symmetry in a crystal, which is not allowed. It's forbidden." And this was Daniel Schechtman, who did win the Nobel Prize, but only ten years after he'd been ridiculed the heck because they thought he was just making it up or, you know, hallucinating into his microscope, but he wasn't. So the Penrose tiling is um, almost like it's almost like the I think what's happening in the world of science and medicine and like is that things are kept very separate so there's a very small handful of mathematicians who understand that tiling and Dugan happens to be one of them who just to put that question out there um, and then there are um, nano scientists who make quasi crystals in laboratories who do it with a with a remarkably skilled trial and error but they don't necessarily have quite the intimate knowledge of the math. I hope I'm not going to offend any of them by saying that, but you know, that's the way it is. So in answer to your question, Dugan, it was thrilling and extremely humbling. I wrote my paper. I wrote it in this room where I'm sitting now because of the snowstorm and I had to come to town. My friend Lisa gave me a room to use as, um, as a, a sort of residency studio. And it's the maid, maid's quarters of her beautiful arts and crafts house. And I, when I finished my paper and I thought it was brilliant, I submitted it for peer review and the mathematicians just 
throw half of it out. They're like, well, you can't hypothesize. You, can't, you have to be very, very precise and this has to be correct. So I'm, I'm working on a second paper now, which covers more of what I had discovered, but there's a huge gap between making a new discovery and actually having it accepted and, and, and publishing it. Um, and I also wanna to say to you, I am not inventing anything. This is like, if you had six pieces of paper, six squares of paper, and you join them together in a cross shape, you could fold them up and they form a cube. It just happens. You don't make it, you're not being creative. And it's the same thing with the quasicrystals. I'm actually figuring out how quasicrystals form in nature. I'm not figuring out how they should or might or what I would like them to do. I'm actually exploring something that's too small to see. So they, they do form in meteorites. So we know that they form in nature, but then they fall to our, oh, and humans first inadvertently created quasicrystals in 1945 in New Mexico when they set off an atomic bomb that vaporized the copper and the concrete and all the buildings. So it takes a lot to make a quasicrystal, um, but we, we do it, it's kind of clever. And I think I won't be the only one dreaming about quasi crystals tonight after watching that video. <laughs> Thank you for watching it. I, I, I want to credit the musician, um, Todd Reynolds, who wrote that piece of music. It's an original piece of music. And I think it helps you just disappear into the mystery of it. I love it. You talked really eloquently about the um, geometry, saving your life and, um, kind of being something that you could get stuck into that I mean you didn't use the word control but there was something about the fact that it was it, it was something that you knew what was happening it was a, it's a safe something safe about it and I just wondered um whether the medium of stained glass has a parallel in the sense that you've got your glass and your lead and, and your heart almost harnessing and, and shaping and controlling these pieces and these elements together and, and whether you thought there was any connection there in, in the way that you felt about the medium yeah, you know, I think I took up stained glass. I knew I had to be a maker. I knew I couldn't trust myself to live in my head. My head was my biggest enemy. You know, you, if you have a, a, a sharp mind, it can tell you all kinds of stuff. It's not true, you know. And my head was my enemy. And I knew I would have to be a maker. So the hands-on business of making was really important to me. I think I chose stained glass what, because it's difficult. It's a challenge, it's not easy. So one of the things was I was so transfixed with light and sparkle. You know, my earliest memory as a child, like a baby in my crib, is looking at sparkles on the window from the lamp outside and trying to figure out why they were all concentric. I didn't understand that the entire window was scratched and they just looked concentric. I mean, you know, so those things obsessed me from when I was really young. But the thing about stained glass is it's really challenging. Uh, it's difficult, it's many level. It's it's also like really comforting when you start making the progress. So then you stare at that bank, blank piece of paper and it's absolutely terrifying. Like, you know, so then you've got to figure out how to get started. And I always use geometry as a kind of calm my nerves tool. So even if it was a rectangle, I would compare the width to the height and I'd start drawing some geometry around it. If you've got an old window with tracery, you, you need to look at the tracery if you want to integrate your design anyway. So I would use geometry as a tool to get me going. And then I'd do my sketches and scribbles and, and then I'd come up with my, my design. But the point is that is the most painful bit is, is trying to get something on paper, you know, and get your design to your client. When you've done that, everything gets easier. Like, I mean, it's so joyful to actually finish your cut line. Actually, I love cutting. I'm a good fast cutter. And I learned a lot when I was at God and give love cutting. So the joy of cutting. And then once you've cut it, I've made a commitment. I don't go back and change my mind or rarely, rarely do I change my mind. So then I've made all those decisions and it's like I can breathe a bit more slowly. And then once you get your trace lines on, I, I paint, by the way, everybody in two, three layers so that I paint with your regular trace line and matting, but I also do textural effects and I use those to control transparency um, and also to create a more interesting texture. I think that um, a badgered mat, it's kind of like the enemy 
of transparency. It's just flat and solid, you know, and I want my windows to sparkle. I don't want to paint a badgered mat over a piece of antique that cost me 350 bucks for that sheet, you know? And I love the sparkle, you know, you move your head and it sparkles. So once you've got your trace lines on and you fire them, oh, it's joyful and fun to put the texture on it. And then when you, I easel it back up again, I still, I, I'm determined to teach more Americans to easel up their work. Easel it when you select, easel it when you paint. And I don't mean every stage of painting, but when you put that final matting on or you do need the modeling and shading, you have to be able to see it against the daylight and the natural environment if you're painting um, on transparent glass. You have to, and you cannot read color against a light box. You just can't. I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah, okay, I won't get on my hobby horse about that. But the thing about then, then once you've painted it, it's so fun letting up stained glass windows. It's pure joy. It's pure joy, pure craftsmanship. You know, so for me, the process gets, it, it starts out really painful and then it gets really, really nice. <laughs> And that's partly because of the limitations of the medium, isn't it? Once you've you've got your actual window opening, if it's for a window, you're 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 stuck within those parameters. So you've got parameters and limitations each each step of the way. Which um, I, I want I want limitations. I mean, with yeah. the Menfunk series, my problem was I didn't know how big they were going to be. And I sat in a cafe with Richard, and I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know what he says. Deb, you've got to get them under your arm. They have to be made from plywood so they can be shipped abroad. You have to be able to carry them. So the, the, the pieces were made according to the limitations of the project. And I really, really like limitations. I really, it makes me feel safe. Yeah. Um, and Vanessa asks, what does easel up your work mean? I think you mean painting to the light. So putting the glass up against the natural light in a window. Is that, that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, there's lots of videos that are online where you can see me easeling up. So in the old days, you would have a clear sheet of glass you put your pieces of glass down and you blob little bits of wax and you can hold it up against the daylight. So you're painting against real daylight with some sort of background behind you. If you paint on the light box, everything is opalescent because light boxes are opalescent. So you miss a lot. And of course, easeling up is the only way that medieval glass artists could paint it. Because they didn't have electricity. Like we haven't had electricity for three days. <laughs> Um, a final question then, Deb, because you, you talked a bit about your, your teaching and um, do you do courses often? I think we can circulate a link to any events you've got coming up, but um, how does that work? Do you have kind of open classes? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting fussy. I only teach four people at a time because it, I really want to be able to teach. So in my, I have a I've narrowed it down so it's nice and simple. There's one five day um, residential trace and texture. So learn my technique. And my goal there is that people will leave knowing how to mix anything and paint it on glass. So I, I want to encourage everybody to come to the next week's talk by Petri Anderson. And he apparently kind of puts uh, steel wool in a pestle and mortar and, and mashes it up and you can paint with it. You can paint with anything that's powdered. And I can teach you how to get the consistency right so you can control the drying time. It's really crucial and it makes it fun when you can control your drying time. So um, my goal for that one week um, intro class is that people can go away and paint with anything. So you could use it with enamels, you can use it with silver stain, you can use it with any paints that you want. And if you live somewhere where you don't have access to paint that's expensive, like the Rouché paints that we use, you can buy other minerals and other materials. So you can go back to a more medieval way of painting where you've just got iron oxide and then you mix it with, you know. So that, that's my goal is to just make sure people can do that. And then many people just go away and do their own work happily with that. And the other thing I'm teaching is a masterclass where it's a design and an advanced glass painting workshop. And I will teach every year. I'm determined to, to teach, but there won't be very many spots. Although I'm hoping that I have actually made moves towards training someone else and other people to teach. And also everything is available online. I want everything to be open source and easily available. So you could go online, you could download my student notes, you could have a go at it, and then you could email me if you have a question. I'd love to help. Brilliant. 
Thank you, Deborah. And we will circulate um, links after this talk to all of you um, and those who couldn't join us this evening, but book tickets. So Deborah, thank you again for such an illuminating and broad um, introduction to your work and all of the interesting areas that you look at um, from the kind of very traditional working in a glass studio to the absolutely unique uh, combining glass and geometry in, in a way that I've never ever seen before and um, is really exciting to hear. So thank you. And thank you also Deborah for um, just plugging Petri's talk next week. Um, it is the final talk in the Stained Glass Museum's artist series this spring. You can still get tickets um, and Petri Anderson is a UK based artist who will be talking about some of his recent work and I'm sure touching on some of those techniques that Deborah mentioned, this kind of return to uh, using original materials if you like for paint rather than buying pre-mixed paints. The Stained Glass Museum, um, for those of you who don't uh, know and, and are joining us from abroad, is a, a really amazing collection of stained glass that's housed in Ely Cathedral um, in Cambridgeshire in the UK. Uh, here are some pictures of the gallery and Deb Deborah's work um, that she called Mask, we have it titled Self Portrait, so we need to update that label, um, is actually on permanent display in this gallery in this uh, medieval cathedral that dates back to the 7th century, uh, present building 11th century onwards. Uh, we are a small independent museum, so I always flag up opportunities to stay in touch and support us. Please do go to our website to find out more. Um, but thank you, Deborah, uh, for speaking to us. Thank you so much for being a hero in the snow. We really hope that you get back home safe. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Jasmine, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm thrilled. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.